Hi, I'm Craig. Welcome to the Libra FM podcast, where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. And I am Karen. This month, we got to sit down with Sarah Novak, who is the author of the novel True Biz, which has been out for a while, but actually was just re-released in paperback. Yes. And this episode is a little different, Karen, as you can see on video. Um, I'm terrified. <laughs> I, same. This is a whole different ball game for us, Craig. Uh, so for context, for people who are listening to this podcast in the audio format, for the first time ever, we are recording this fully on video uh, to be released on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Our big premiere. Um <laughs> Yes. If you are listening to this on your podcast app, totally fine. The episode absolutely works in audio. But if you feel like it, I do recommend watching the video of it. I think that it is a just fuller experience. So for context, the author Sarah Novick is deaf. So we had a ASL interpreter um, for the episode. So if you do watch the video, you'll get to see kind of the signing back and forth. And I think it just kind of adds to the kind of the experience of this episode. I totally agree. The interpreter did a phenomenal job and it, it was so wonderful to be able to be with Sarah live and watch her sign. Um, one of my highlights was that we learned Sarah and I have the the same favorite snack food. So I now know how to sign popcorn, <laughs> which is going to be helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I also really enjoyed this interview, um, even though I don't love popcorn. Um, we got to learn so much about the book and really kind of dive deep into the the characters and also the process of her recording the audiobook was probably one of my I think the most interesting things so again for context when the deaf characters are speaking back and forth you actually hear the sounds of somebody signing in the background of the audio clips um and it was so interesting we got to see a video of it and she um the recording person I apologize to who, who, whatever that job title is um <laughs> I can't imagine it's recording person um told her to wear loud clothing and just her story about going into like the booth and all that was really interesting. And yeah. um, if you haven't listened to the audiobook, I will play a clip of it before the interview starts so you can kind of hear what I'm talking about. Awesome. Well, without further ado, let's roll the clip. Let's play the interview. And um, as always, you can stick around afterwards to um, chat with Craig and myself a little bit more about what audiobooks we're listening to. And we do have some exciting updates about forthcoming episodes of the podcast. But now he worried that the problems of the boys sleeping in the bed five feet away from him were about to become his problems, too. What are you doing? Elliot looked at him like he was an alien. Smoking. You mind? Austin considered how to answer without coming off prudish. Did he want to get in trouble or catch some second-hand lung pustule? Not particularly, though that wasn't the real question. What Elliot was really asking was whether he was a snitch. You're gonna get caught. He motioned with his head at the alarm above their door. Am not, Elliot said and turned back toward the window to exhale. Austin studied the rutted skin running down from Elliot's ear. On his cheek, a strip of stubble had been permanently raised away, and an ugly splay of vesicles disappeared beneath the neck of his T-shirt. But so what? Even if the stories were true, that didn't give him free reign to be a dick. Whatever. I'm going to dinner. Heard she's already looking for you. What? From who? Elliot laughed, a bit too heartily for Austin's liking. I'm messing with you. I haven't talked to anyone yet. Should have seen your face, though. He dropped the cigarette butt into an old Gatorade bottle, and Austin kept his eye on it until he was sure it had burned out completely. Well, nice to see you again, Sarah. Thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. This is actually our second time getting to speak with you as we read True Biz for our book club here at Libro. So thanks for making the time twice to talk with us. Yes, and I think Craig and I both just actually reread True Biz for the second time, um, and it was just as good the second time through. And we also wanted to congratulate you on the paperback edition that's coming out soon. That's really exciting. Um, so for our listeners, we would love for you to introduce yourself um, and share a little bit about who you are and what you do.
Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you again. And thank you for reading the book uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> also, <laughs> uh, my name is Sarah and I am a writer and I am also a teacher. I teach um, a creative writing at a couple colleges and I also teach deaf, I teach creative writing and deaf studies. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for the introduction. And we have a lot of questions ready for you today. So I think we'll just dive in. And um, Craig, do you want to you want to get us started? Sure. Um, so our first question, you had to see this coming is about audiobooks. Um, on Instagram, you shared a video of the recording process with you in the booth. And you said sound can't do ASL justice, but I like the additive sentiment. For folks who haven't read the book in audio format, I'd love if you can give us some insight into what that process was like. Well, it was really fun to be involved with um, making the audio book because really for me as a deaf individual, uh, I never thought I would have the opportunity to be involved in that process. But um, I really wanna back up and talk about what happened um, before, uh, the book was published. So we, as a team, we were ready to talk a little bit more in depth about, um, the different parts of the publication process. And we had all the, you know, different processes ready. And I think in the middle of the night, one night I woke up and I was like, oh shit. Well, I didn't even think about what to do for an audiobook, <laughs> um, you know, and how we would make that happen. Because in the book, on paper, I have mm, different systems for showing different, um, you know, parallels between ASL and English that I can show on paper, um, you know, with the dialogue in written English and how that looks different than the dialogue that would be happening in sign language. So I was a little bit concerned that if people were listening to the book, you know, how would they know the difference? So first of all, uh, because a lot of it depends on, it depends on who's speaking. Uh, it could be important information if there's, you know, um, someone switching back and forth between the two or if it changes from spoken language to sign language. Um, so I didn't want um, it to become... Uh, um, become confusing because people speaking, uh, you know, between the people speaking, being able to differentiate what languages were being used. But at the same time, I wanted people to have some feeling within the audiobook as well. So, because part of the goal was of the book was to teach people a little bit more about ASL, about what it looks like and feels like. Um, so, you know, wanted to create that picture and then, you know, thinking of how to involve that in an audio book. Uh, for me, I have to say, um, you know, the audio team, um, you know, I have to give full credit to them. I cannot take any other credit <laughs> because for me, I was just, I was really scared of the process and I didn't know what it was going to look like. So I had kind of put it out there and see, see if I could get some support with that. And they came back with a few ideas um, to involve maybe the sound of sign. Um, when they tell, when they told me that first, I didn't really understand what they meant. Uh, and they sent me a video of someone, a signer, and, um, they said maybe like that. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, 
you know, I was like, like what exactly? And um, so I kind of had to force them to really tell me what they mean. Um, you know, like the sound of the signs, your hands on your body, on your clothes, the sounds that you might hear of different kinds of touch and, you know, or on the mouth as well. So um, I had never thought about that before. So I was like, oh, okay. Okay, well, that clarifies. <laughs> um, and then I was really excited to be involved um, with the booth. And they told me they wanted me to wear loud clothing. <laughs> uh, and I was like, okay. And so I was involved with networking and reaching out to people and doing all of that as well. Um, and you know, I was like, I, I reached out to some friends. I was like, I don't know what loud clothing is, but, (laughs) (laughs) uh, but anyway, so it was, it was fun because during, when I was writing the book, I had this picture in my mind where I would see people signing in my head, but you know, it was a different experience for me as well, having that physical experience. So I was like, how will I, you know, I had to be like, how would I sign that sentence? Um, and kind of take on that role, like become the character a little bit. So it was fun as well. Have you gotten any feedback from folks who have listened to the audiobook about how they received it? Because it is quite different than other audiobooks that I've listened to. Like you do, he- you do hear the signing, like you said, and apparently you can hear the loud clothing. Um, have you um, received any feedback about, about how it came out? Um, I happy, I'm happy I picked the right shirt, (laughs) uh, (laughs) but most people who, um, contacted me told me that they liked the experience. Um, I assume if you hate it, you probably wouldn't email the author. I I don't know. (laughs) I mean, sometimes, sometimes people do, but (laughs) But most of the people who have been in touch with me about the audiobook, um, you know, have had really positive things to say. They said they enjoyed it. Um, and many people told me that listening to the audiobook after they had, uh, when they had finished with the book and then they, you know, that uh, a lot of people told me when they finished the audiobook, they wanted to buy the the actual book as well. Um, so, and then see the picture as well. So maybe those things kind of can connect, um, and create a more streamlined experience. Awesome. One of the questions that we had, um, and you mentioned this in your intro. So you are, you are a teacher of deaf studies and of creative writing. Um, and true biz obviously is about, uh, a learning institute. Uh, and there are, there are lots of teachers and students as characters. Um, we were curious how your own experience informed, um, your writing style and true biz and also the content of the book. Sure. Uh, there were many people who had asked me if I was one of the character, if there was a character that I de- I identified with. And really for me, the fun thing about this book is I had the opportunity to put a little of myself in several characters. Uh, and the obvious connection between me and the character Charlie is that um, we were both, I grew up in a mainstream educational environment as well, and it felt very isolating. And I didn't meet other deaf people until later in life. Um, So that experience is is similar. And uh, that's a pretty common experience for deaf individuals as well. Um, Most deaf people today are in a mainstream classroom environment and most um, deaf people have hearing families. Most families don't learn sign language as well. So all of that, for me, uh, you know, I I think I was most of the, I think that's most deaf people. Um, 
but during the writing of the characters, um, I really became connected more and more with the principal character, whose name is uh, February. So like the month, uh, February, she has a name sign as well. Mm. And I also started the book before I had kids. And when I, I was in the process of writing um, during, and then that kind of changed my perspective. And I was able to identify more with the teacher and some of the parents in the book um, through that process of becoming a parent myself. That's Thank you for sharing that. Um, speaking more about the educational components, you mentioned um, that sometimes the book shows the different signs and in, in the audiobook you hear it. In addition to that, most, if not all chapters, start with an actual educational component, whether it's like from an old book or some kind of historical piece or just like kind of a how-to. And I was curious, like, why did you decide that that was an important piece to have in the book? Yeah. When I started writing the book, I really felt strongly that I didn't want um, to teach people um, about uh, deaf culture. I, I didn't want to. I felt a little bit of a resistance to that. And I wanted I wanted to write a story. You know, I wanted it to be fun. Uh, and then... I gave it to my editor and they had given me back. They had so many questions for me, <laughs> uh, you know, and a lot of the questions were really related to the way that deaf people interact and the way that deaf people think and our perspective. And so that's kind of the real reason hearing people have a really limited understanding of our culture and our view of the world. So I realized that if I wanted people to connect with the characters and empathize with their stories, then I would have to do that educational piece as well. Uh, but luckily, I, uh, you know, had the book set in a school, so I was like, okay, maybe we can play a little bit with the form of the book or the structure of the book, and it would kind of be teaching at the same time, but not in a way that interrupts the story or feels preachy. Um, so I was thinking about how I could design the like maybe a sign list for different characters and then you have the history um and you know what the landscape of the characters would be in the time the time that they were in school given that in the beginning of your process you seemed pretty resistant to doing that but then got the feedback that it might be helpful now that it's done and out in the world and you have the book how do you feel about how it came out, given that it wasn't kind of your original vision for it. I feel happy that so many people have seemed to find the book accessible and when they are finished with the book, people have reported that they want to learn more. Uh, so I think that is positive. Um, and I think it was challenging because I wanted to write kind of for two separate audiences at the same time. I felt like I was writing for two audiences. I was writing for deaf people, um, you know, and I wanted deaf people to enjoy the story and see, you know, the diversity within the community and the characters. Um, and then writing for hearing people 
you know, you kind of had to put in some basic level stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was that was a challenge for sure, going through that entire process. And I don't know if I found the balance. I mean, it, it was hard. Um, and I, th I think the book really works well. Um, and now I'm sure if I look again, I would change like 1,000 things, right? <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I feel like that's always how it goes. Yeah. That's why there's so many different editions of books, probably. Yeah. And one of the things that I found so interesting, too, is that you had the, you know, the homework assignments or the actual on paper learning that these characters were doing. But um, there was also so much shown learning, like visceral learning in the body. Um, I think of the scene where Charlie and Austin are walking together and she hasn't yet kind of learned that she needs to stand a certain distance from him in order to be able to see what he's signing and things like that, that I had never heard about or been exposed to were really interesting learnings for me. Um, so I thought there was a lot of, a lot of very unique, different ways that you approached teaching people um, without letting us know that you were teaching us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I think that relates to the character, Charlie, um, and it kind of leads into the deaf community, uh, you know, and because Charlie is new as well uh, to the community. So, yeah, it's a it's a good way in, I think, having that character um, and can kind of follow through her complete immersion within the community feeling overwhelmed and going through that process totally well speaking of charlie being one of the many characters in this book um true biz is told through many perspectives and i loved getting the the singular story through so many different lenses of deaf people and hearing people and teenagers and adults and you got a lot of different perspectives and i'm can you speak to why you decided to take that particular approach to tell this story I think one of the best things about the deaf community is our diversity. We are not the same as other kinds of cultures because we all come from different backgrounds. You know, we could be different racial and ethnic groups, different experiences, different places. Uh, so there's just really quite a variety. And I think that's important because typically if you see deaf characters in movies, TV, films, uh, you know, it's it's usually just one uh, deaf person, uh, you know, and it's like, hi, okay, here's a deaf person, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's typically done in a way that feels sorry for the character. So I wanted to create an opportunity to have different kinds of deaf folks um, within one place. And so maybe, you know, maybe we'll just have our token hearing person. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I also, I think because there are so many different deaf people in the book, it gives them the opportunity to have different personalities as well. So many people don't think about the ways that deaf people, you know, we're, there's a human behind that person. So, you know, we have different behaviors and different quirks and things that we do and personalities. And sometimes, um, you know, deaf people also do drugs and make mistakes and have their lives blown up or, you know, um, but, but it was really fun too. So it's, it doesn't always have to be about being this poor deaf person going through their struggle, you know, or pitying them. I think, you know, having some just regular teenage stuff blown, uh, thrown in there and kind of showing the enjoyment in life for deaf people as well. Well, you mentioned, you know, at the, right at the beginning of that response, the diversity of the community and a moment that I found really powerful um, 
kind of towards the middle of the book is when Austin corrects Kayla's signing and she says, uh, no, uh, have you ever heard of black ASL? And that is a huge learning moment for him. That's a learning moment for Charlie. Um, their kind of embarrassment about having corrected her carries on for like several more chapters. And, um, I started thinking a lot about how much perspective most people probably lack about the deaf community, about sign language in general, um, and got very impressed with and also overwhelmed by the scope of what you had taken on <laughs> by writing this book. Um, there are so many other things alluded to, you know, in terms of like money and deafness and how that interacts and age um, generations and and what their perspectives are. Um, so I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your process of defining the scope of this book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, overwhelming is a good way to describe it. <laughs> but I think that my writing process was really... I'm I'm not a planner. <laughs> so I have to think, you know, if I it if I sit down and I thought about, you know, the scope of the book and how would I explain X, Y, and Z, I I think I would have never ever written this book. Um but I started with the idea of three kids, um, you know, get, uh, kind of running away from the school, the deaf school. And I, I just had, you know, kind of questions formed from there. Where would they go? Yeah, you know, I, I didn't know where they were going to go at, at that point. And so I thought, well, you know, that would be kind of interesting to start a story from a perspective as if they had already gotten away from the school and then I kind of backed up and was like well what's that situation I don't know but to make those characters I wanted to explain why they do the things that they do and that's where um you know all of that stuff just kind of got involved and you know it it, it expanded into the characters that I have now I loved the opening of the book that you just referred to. I was like, where are they going and who are they and why are they leaving? It was so good. <laughs> I, I, I mean, so that's, the, that's the same process I went through. So, <laughs> you know, I was experiencing that as, as I was writing them. <laughs> well, luckily for us, we didn't have to figure it out. We just got to enjoy it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, short, shorter process for, for yeah. the readers, maybe. <laughs> a little bit. Um, while I was reading True Biz both times, I found myself thinking this would make such a good movie. I want to see this as on, on film. So I, I Googled True Biz adaptation and it seems like it is going to be a movie or a show or details were hard to find. But luckily for me, I can just ask you. Um, so I'm curious if you have any details you could share with us. Yeah, right now, um, there's not really anything to, there's nothing set in stone. We are developing um, something for TV, a, a series. And the character Charlie will be Millie Simons, I believe, um, from uh, the Quiet Place movies. And uh, which I think uh, she's perfect for that. She's she's the obvious choice. And most of the time, these things don't actually get made sometimes so but uh you know we the process is going along <laughs> and uh you know i'm i'm keeping my fingers crossed and uh you know i really love i would love to see um 
see it as a movie or on film. I think that would be really cool to have a lot of deaf people um, represented on screen. Yeah, the only detail I found was who was going to play Charlie. And I, like you, was like, that's perfect. She was amazing in The Quiet Place. And I, that's a perfect um, casting. So super exciting. And yes, the thing that we have learned through doing this podcast is that TV and movies is always very up in the air until filming starts. So um, <laughs> we will cross our fingers for you as well. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of the media, we were wondering if there are any other authors or artists that you particularly admire um, and look to when it comes to um, helping increase representation and knowledge about the deaf community. Hmm. Yeah, there are really a lot of talented actors. I think it's possible to start seeing more people kind of coming up on, on television now and related to books. I think that um, everyone should read Ilya um, Kamin Kaminsky. Um, she wrote a book called Deaf Republic. Uh, it's it's a really brilliant work. Um, so it's I think that's an important read. Uh, and another really cool deaf artist whose name is Christine Sun Kim. She is a visual artist and she also plays with um, sign language in her art um, uh, and, and sound as well. And I think her art would be really fun for people to take a look at or include in some kind of audio, audio book um, because she plays a lot with sound as well. Awesome. Oh, I can't wait to look all of this up as soon as we get off the <laughs> off the call. <laughs> so, Sarah, we have a new-ish segment of the podcast that we would like to do with you. Craig and I have been calling this the lightning round, and we have six, five, five or six very random questions that we will ask you. Don't think too hard about them. Uh, just respond and go on the journey <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm ready <laughs> all right our first one is perhaps the most random one we've ever had if you had to get a tattoo right now craig and i will pay for it what would you get Uh, well, I was thinking about recently adding one more tattoo. So I think the one I've been thinking about, it would be a picture, um, connecting to, um, the birth of, uh, my son, uh, my, the birth mother of my son, uh, so, because that's where he is coming from. So awesome. Very cool. Um, if you could have one snack food, for, only one snack food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Popcorn. <laughs> Me too. That's also my choice. <laughs> yeah, I just had some for lunch, actually. <laughs> Do you have a, um, or is there a special kind of popcorn, like movie popcorn or like cheese popcorn or just any old popcorn will do? Mm. Popcorn as a butter delivery system. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What is a fad or trend from your childhood that you miss? <laughs> Trapper keeper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. Oh my God. I love it. 
uh, I wish uh, you could still, I don't know if you can still buy those, but I don't know either. I wish, I wish you could. <laughs> I, I, I never see them. So I don't know. <laughs> um, winter or summer and why? Hmm. That's a difficult question. I think I would always say summer. Probably in the summertime, I would say winter. <laughs> <laughs> when you're when you're sweating and the air conditioner is on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the window for my the window of comfort for my body, I would say, is very narrow. <laughs> you know, it's got to be the right temperature. So yes. it's always too hot or too cold. I don't know what's wrong with me, but. <laughs> I'm very much the same way. I don't know why I asked winter or summer. I would prefer spring or fall to both of those. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think fall would probably be my first option. I think that would be the best. <laughs> Agreed. All right, this is the last one. Uh, what is your favorite thing to do in your city? <laughs> well, I'm from Phil... Phil Philadelphia. So, um, you know, everyone is obsessed with sports and football. And right now the Eagles are going to be playing in the Super Bowl. So uh, I like the food. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> but I really, um, the thing I really appreciate about Philly is the attitude problem we have. <laughs> so I really enjoy, you know, repping Philadelphia and, and the attitude that we have, you know, about talking <laughs> about how great we are. I, I think Libro also likes to represent Philadelphia. This is our second Philadelphia based episode in a row now. On our last episode, we interviewed Janine Cook, who owns Harriet's Bookshop, which is also in Philadelphia. So we're uh, big fans over here as well. Oh, yeah. Harriet's is awesome. Uh, you know, we have a really we have a lot of really great indie bookstores here. So that's a good answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that is it for lightning round. Thank you for playing along. We have one more um, similar type question that we call Instagram story time, where we pick a random or not random. We, we purposefully choose <laughs> an Instagram post from the guest and ask for the story behind it. Um, for you, about two weeks ago, you posted some beautiful, a black and white photo of a building. And you said that you took the students from the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf to tour the grounds of the residential campus. And the photos were beautiful and the, the story that you wrote on the post was was also and I was curious if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, so that area, the campus was it was really a visual way for me to think about what the school in the book would look like in the book troop is. So it was kind of inspired by that. And right now uh, we had high school students at Pennsylvania school for the deaf PSD um, who are reading the book. And we all took a tour together with the school Um and I think that the teacher um, was running the museum there as well. So we did a, they guided us through the tour of the campus and, um, you know, we got to see different parts of the campus and different buildings. So uh, it was, it was really touching because that campus is really big and they used to have 2000 students attending the school and now it has shrunk quite a bit. Uh, and now they only have 200 students. Wow. 
so uh, yeah, it's um, not a residential school. It is only a day school for now. Um, and there are, you know, the old school had lots of different resources. Like they had, um, I'm trying to think, they had a car mechanic um, program and they had different like Vogue programs. They also had a hairdressing program and, you know, they had obvious academic programs as well. But it's more just um, the resources um, that the school used to have. And also they had more um, things that were being run by deaf people as well in the past. And now because of the way that um, oral education that has a focus on speech and lip reading has kind of taken over the school most of the time there they have hearing faculty hearing teachers um, hearing people in positions of administration at the school and PSD still has a lot of deaf teachers but most places have a really hard time finding um, deaf teachers. They have a hard time getting enough students uh, because, you know, the schools have been whittled down and people have been kind of um, moved to different uh, places. So, so uh, you know, it, it was a really beautiful place and facility, and it was also a little bit sad at the same time because the kids were really shocked to see that it was so big and there were so many, you know, they were like, wow, all of this stuff was here for deaf people. That's so cool. Uh, mm, yeah. And it kind of made me think a lot about the importance of passing down that history as well, because when we left, there's no signs or anything saying that this used to be a deaf academy. Um, the old buildings are just kind of sitting there. Yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> this is the saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I should have picked one of the cute photos of your children. <laughs> um. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really brought the mood down. Huh? No, it's great. I, 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 I'm somewhat joking. I mean, it's a, I'm glad to know that story, but it is, it is disheartening. Um, are there institutions that exist that are closer to what that vision was that are, you know, this one particular one has been, like you said, the head count is so much lower and it doesn't exist in that same way anymore, but are there places in the, in the states that that does exist still or is this like a kind of systematic issue um a little bit of both so the system um has made it really difficult for deaf kids to go to the deaf school because um public school has to provide a referral for the deaf residential school and they don't want to because then you know they get uh they get paid per student um right. so let's see many times parents will need to fight for their kids to get that referral um and one of the other reasons that deaf schools have been shutting down or have diminished is because uh, MMR, uh, the MMR vaccine, uh, there are many deaf people um, who were deaf um, because they got rubella uh, or measles. It was a, a side effect of having measles. And now there are less um deaf people uh but yeah uh there are still some deaf residential schools 
Um, there are some diff, big deaf schools. We call them the big five. Uh, so there's in DC, California, Texas. Um, there, I know there's more, but I'm not remembering. And there are several who didn't just shrink in size, they shut down. Um, so we see that you, and you can see a list of, of um, the schools that have shut down in the back of the book as well. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes. And uh, Sarah, I think we have one last question for you. I am required by my coworkers by law to ask you this. What are you reading right now? And do you have any book recommendations for us? <laughs> <laughs> Right now, I am in the middle of reading a book called Black Cake. Um, and it's it, it it I know it was really popular a few years ago. So, um, and that's that's what I'm reading so far. So. And I'm trying to think of any good recommendations, something that I maybe have recently finished. Hmm. Everything that I've read recently um, has not yet been published. <laughs> They'll be published <laughs> this year, but maybe something to look forward to. Uh, one book that I really loved was called Lucky. Um, Lucky Red, it's called. And I um, typically don't read this type of book, but it's um, like a Western, uh, but it also has some queer themes. Awesome. So it's it's a really fun read. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm in it now. And I'm, I'm ready for, I, I, you know, I've drank the Kool-Aid. I'm ready for Westerners. <laughs> yeah, how, how can you say no to queer cowboys, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then there's females in there as well. Yes. <laughs> this happens to me all the time with reading books that aren't out yet. I went into my local bookstore literally yesterday to get the paper version of a book that I'm listening to. And the person was looking it up on the computer and was like, this doesn't come out until April. And I was like, oh, sorry. And then just <laughs> walked out of the bookstore embarrassed. <laughs> Are you from the future? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today, Sarah, especially since this is the second time coming to talk yes. to us. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this has been such a yes, great conversation. I enjoyed it so much. Well, well, we'll figure out a way to get you back here a third time, you know, just just in case you aren't sick of us yet. So. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thank you again. Uh, maybe I'll write another book. Please do. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you in another year. Perfect. Perfect. We can't wait. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Well, thank you for listening to our interview, everyone, and, and watching us. We feel very awkward. So thanks for sticking with us. <laughs> yes. And I was telling Karen before the show that we recorded that episode a, a little while ago. And I'm like, I hope well, I don't remember what I was wearing. I hope I don't look horrible. So um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, it'll be, no it'll be a surprise to me when I go to edit this in a little bit. <laughs> well, as always, I have a question for you. Nope. Nope, I have a question for you, actually. Uh, Karen, what are you listening to? Oh. I feel like I always have to go first. I don't know. Okay, okay, that's fair. Um, I was hoping you would ask this question. I just <laughs> listened to what will undoubtedly be at least one of my top three favorite books of 2023, if not number one. And I would be so bold as to say it is an all-time favorite book. Wow. Those Loved are... it. it well... Is... <laughs> I was like, do you want to know the name? <laughs> it's called I Keep My Exoskeletons to Myself, which is a long title, and I love it. Uh, and it's by Marissa Crane. 
let me tell you this book. It's so the premise of the plot is that we're in a slightly distant future, not so distant future Mm -hmm. where the penal system has changed. And if you are accused of a crime, instead of going to prison, you are given an extra shadow. So all of a sudden, everyone has this visual indicator of the crimes that you have committed. Um, And there are all of these other punishments associated with it, like higher tax brackets, and you have to live in certain places and yada, yada. Um, That is the like, world in which we are living. But the book is about relationships and raising a child and grief and it's just stunning. It felt like a long poem to me. The writing is just mm. some of the most incredible writing I've come across in a long time. I also read this book um, I know. Based, <laughs> based off your <laughs> suggestion. And I also, it was, um, I think the first like five star book on Storygraph for me this year. I agree. This book was amazing. Absolutely loved it. Um, and I think you explaining it as like a long form poem is perfect. Um I think I said to you, you can almost take like any line and like print it out in a frame and it would be like a beautiful print. Like the the prose is just absolutely beautiful throughout all the way through. Um, really, really point, great. I had to stop myself from like writing phrases down and highlighting them, like things mm. that I wanted to keep forever and remember because then just, the whole book is just highlighted. I'm highlighting yeah. this entire book. Like yeah. it's just stunning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so good. We will have to see if we can get Marissa on the podcast. Marissa, can you hear me? <laughs> if you ask me to edit that out, the answer is no. <laughs> I would never. I know better. Um, okay. <laughs> to prevent me from singing more, what are you? No, no, keep going. To? Keep going, actually. <laughs> I, I won't. That, yeah. I won't. <laughs> um, what have I listened to recently? So I, like I said, I definitely read Exoskeletons like you. I also, my other... My other and only five star book this year that I most that I most recently read is Big Swiss, which I also know you read um, <laughs> because this has just become our thing now, which makes sense. We run a, we do a podcast together about books. <laughs> um, Big Swiss was amazing. Loved it. It is heartbreaking and also laugh out loud funny at points. The gist of it for listeners, if you are inclined to listen to it, um, is the main character Greta is like a like a transcriber. Is that the word I'm looking for? For the like local hippy dippy therapist in Hudson, New York, and you get to learn about all the the characters in this town via these interviews um, that she's transcribing. And I love that as she's listening to the recording and transcribing, she's like interjecting her thoughts on them and pausing it, like as if it's a soap opera. Um, and it's about her life, and uh, it's so good, so good. Go get it now. Yeah. Jennifer Began is the author of that book. Thank you and for saving me. I was over here like on, I got the, you. on the side trying to look <laughs> it up. So thank you. I And I think she's written two other novels prior to Big Swiss. And so I'm, I have that on my TBR. I'm like, ever I growing TBR. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we teased a little bit at the beginning of the episode that we would talk about what we have coming up next. Oh, and yes. We have got to talk to so many amazing authors, but I have to say that the next two are some of the two that I am, <laughs> some of the two, um, <laughs> two of the people I am most excited to speak with. Um, we, I think we've already mentioned this on the podcast previously, but V Schwab yes. of A Darker Shade of Magic and Vicious Vengeful um, and Addie LaRue, Addie which LaRue. I think most people know her from. So exciting. It's finally happening at the end of this month. So can't wait. And then I don't think we've announced this one, but we are going to talk with TJ Klune, who um, I think most people will know from House of the Cerulean Sea, but he's also written his kind of queer superhero flash fire novels. And then he has a new one coming out, which I am in the middle of. And it's so funny and good. Uh, I'm going to start it tonight. I I had another book I was finishing and I've been just waiting to crack this open and I cannot wait. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Like <laughs> I've high, like you with exoskeletons, I have highlighted so many things with the note of just LOL, <laughs> like just parts <laughs> that made me laugh. Um, can't wait um, to, to learn more about it from TJ himself. So oh, that's a glowing recommendation. I'm nervous. Like, 
I get nervous I, before all of our podcasts. I was just going to say the same thing. I so feel that way new, on but... most episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even when we're just talking to like a little local town bookseller, I'm always a little nervous. Um, no. But at least that episode, it will just be our voices and not video like this. Oh, I don't have to worry about our outfits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really, I really dressed up for this, for my big YouTube premiere. This is, this is our formal wear. <laughs> yes. This is what I wear to weddings, actually. It has a collar, so, you know. Um, well, everyone, go get exoskeletons. Go get Big Swiss. And if those episodes we have coming up sound interesting to you, subscribe to the podcast. Oh, yes. On... And um, if you have... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I ruined everything. We oh can't edit God. this. It's a video. Nope. Yeah, this is, this is it. This is just, our true selves excited. on YouTube. I got excited you go. about you our go. promo code. We have a promo code. It's a Libro <laughs> podcast. Uh, you can use it to sign up for a new membership and you will get two audiobooks for your first month of membership instead of just one. Yes. Yes. Go do that. You can get Big Swiss <laughs> and Exoskeletons for the price of one. Um, Can't beat it. Well, everyone, as always, thank you for watching our podcast this month. Thank you so much. Uh, we're sorry for our appearance. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs>